Well, good morning, Honey Ridge family. It's a great joy for me to be able to share the devotion with you this morning. Today is Ascension Day, and so we will be taking a break from our series in James today to consider this most crucial event in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's jump straight in and read together from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. I'm going to read to you from the Christian Standard Bible. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Just so far in God's word. And my focus for the devotion this morning will be uh, on the last half from verses 6 to 11. And the first thing that I want us to see as we come to verse 6 is that the disciples of Jesus had a wrong, a confused misunderstanding of Jesus and his kingdom. Verse 6 says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? Now, John Calvin said of this verse 6, there are as many errors in this question as there are words. So let's look briefly at their misunderstanding. Firstly, they said, at this time. Now, this question betrays a common misunderstanding of the people throughout Jesus' earthly ministry. We can go back to Luke 19, 11 for an example of this, where while they were listening, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. You see, there was an expectation that the appearing of the Messiah would bring about an immediate solution to all their problems. And while that is actually what Jesus accomplished, he addressed their true inner spiritual problem of sin, they were expecting something very different. They were expecting an immediate solution to their earthly situation. And so this betrays the second error in their understanding. They asked Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom? You see, they were expecting Jesus to restore a literal physical kingdom. The Old Testament people of God had once been a kingdom. We, we're looking at that on a, on a Sunday morning in our study in 1 Samuel, the kingdom of Israel, unified under the reign of King David and, and King Solomon. But then it split into two and, and then it was gradually conquered by a whole bunch of enemies from the Assyrians to the Babylonians and, and now finally the Romans. You see, they were still expecting Jesus to march into Jerusalem, to overthrow the political powers, and to reinstate the kingdom of Israel. And so this leads on to their third misunderstanding. They speak specifically about the kingdom of Israel. Their thinking was still very narrow and, and parochial. 
One of the biggest stumbling blocks to, to Jewish thinking was that God had plans and purposes outside of and beyond the nation of Israel. They had missed all the signs and the promises which God had given to his people from the very beginning that they were intended to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. And so they come to Jesus asking him if he was going to restore the physical, political kingdom to Israel as an ethnic nation now. What we see next is that what takes place in verse 7 and 8 was intended by Jesus to to correct their understanding, to give them a right perspective of, of who he is and his kingdom. You see, before Jesus can send out these disciples, he needs to restore a right and a biblical understanding in their hearts and their minds about this great commission that he's just given to them. And so Jesus says to them in verse 7, the timing is not important. Don't worry about God's timing of, of when things will happen. This is under God's sovereign authority and it's not for you to know. Now, this is a, a sobering thought for many groups in modern Christianity who seem overly consumed by the end times. All the details and the predictions of dates and looking for signs. Jesus tells his disciple the timing is in God's hands, so don't worry about it. But then secondly, Jesus says, I need you to understand that the kingdom is spiritual. Look at verse 8. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Jesus' whole emphasis here is spiritual, not political or military might, but spiritual might. And then Jesus corrects their understanding of who the recipients are of this kingdom. And he wants them to understand that the recipients are universal. Look at the end of verse 8. He says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem where they were, in all Judea, the, the surrounding area, and Samaria. Now we things are getting uncomfortable. And even to the ends of the earth. This is totally out of the comfort zone of all of his disciples. And then Jesus says, I want you to be totally clear of your responsibility. You will be my witnesses. This has a clear application to us and our understanding today, doesn't it? Don't worry about when God has decided for the end of the world to come. It'll come. But in the meantime, we are in a spiritual kingdom battle. We are servants of the King of Kings at this time. We are living in what theologians call the, the overlap of the ages. We are still physically living in the age of this physical world, but we are already citizens of the age and the kingdom which is to come. So from the first coming of Jesus to the second coming of Jesus, we are living in this overlap of the ages and we need to get our priorities right as to which kingdom we truly belong to and which kingdom we are serving. So as we are living and moving in this physical world on a daily basis, are our hearts and our minds and our motivations being fed and driven by our membership in God's spiritual kingdom? You see, we do not exist as a church simply to enjoy fellowship and singing on a Sunday morning. We exist as a church to be the witnesses of Jesus Christ to a lost world. Now, if I were to ask you this morning to explain to me, how can I know that you are a Christian? And this ties in so well with what we've been looking at in James over the last couple, couple days. How much of your explanation to that question, how can I know if you are a Christian, how much of your explanation would be linked to your involvement in the church at Honey Ridge? You attend the services, you tithe, you go to a home group, uh, you help with the youth, uh, you may even attend the prayer meeting. 
But how much of your explanation would be linked to what we find in verse 8? Linked to your having received power through the Holy Spirit in order to be witnesses for Jesus Christ in your Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, please don't misunderstand me this morning. More so than ever before, we are all learning how much we appreciate and miss the gathering together of the church on a Sunday. And and we long for that to be possible again soon. Coming to church, singing worship songs together as the, the body of Christ, being involved in Sunday school and Bible studies and prayer meetings and youth groups. These are are all vital parts of our Christian life. But there is very little of Acts chapter 1 verse 8 in these things. There is very little witnessing for Christ that goes on among Christians because we all know him, or at least we should all know him if we are called Christians. You see, the church is not the place for me to come and feel good about being a Christian. The church is what we are, and we are commissioned by Jesus Christ to be his witnesses to our suburb, our city, our country, and yes, to the ends of the world. So coming to church on Sundays is definitely about worshiping God. It's about sitting under the ministry of God's word, enjoying fellowship with other Christians. But worship and teaching and fellowship is not meant to be an end in itself. It's meant to energize our hearts and our minds so that we will leave as witnesses of Jesus Christ who have met with our Lord, who've worshipped him, who've listened to him speak to us, and now we cannot wait to go out and spread the good news with others. And so there's a sad label which has been applied to much of the evangelical church in our day. It's called spiritual obesity. And it refers to people who come to church every week, who get fed a full diet of spiritual food and then do nothing with it. Their spiritual minds have become overweight and lazy because they do not burn up the spiritual calories that they have received through the service and the witness of the kingdom of God. Nothing could be further from the truth of what we see Jesus intended for his disciples here in Acts chapter 1. So Jesus had corrected their wrong understanding. He had restored a a, a right understanding about his kingdom. But they were still not yet ready for the task before them. You see, for everything that Jesus said to them, for all that he had taught them over three years together, Jesus now needs to ascend into heaven. This crucial reality needed to be fully grasped by the disciples. And so Jesus, we read in verse 9, was taken up into heaven before their very eyes. Their Lord and their master was no longer physically present with them. They could no longer stand back and watch as Jesus preached or as Jesus healed or as Jesus mixed with those who desperately needed the gospel. Jesus was gone. But not so that they would suddenly be thrown into the deep end, but so that he could send them his Holy Spirit to empower them to do the work that he had commissioned them to do. I think this is confirmed by the appearance of the angels as the disciples were standing there gazing up as their Lord disappeared before their eyes. The angels asked them a profound question. Why are you standing around staring up into the sky? This same Jesus whom you have seen go up into heaven will return again in the same way. Now, you won't get the job done by staring into the sky. So go now and get on with what he has given you to do. I find it ironic today that many people today want spirituality without obedience. 
But what we find here in Acts chapter 1 is the exact opposite. God gives spiritual power and revelation to those who obey what he commands. So I pray that this focus on the Lord's ascension today will remind us that to be the church doesn't mean standing on a mountaintop to connect with God. But it means to go with God in the power of his Holy Spirit to do the work he has commanded us to do. And what is that work? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for this special time that we could have as your people this morning to remember the ascension of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, back into the very presence of God where he now sits and reigns and rules over all that he has created until that day when he will return again. But Lord, this has also been a, a real challenge to us today to remember that in Jesus' ascension, he commissioned his disciples to go and be his witnesses and he gave them his Holy Spirit to empower them for that task. And so we today, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we want to acknowledge publicly your commission of us to represent you to this world around us, especially at this time, Lord, when there is so much uncertainty and, and hurt and heartache and, and confusion. And as people are being faced with the reality of, of a disease and, and the end of their lives, potentially, we pray, Lord, that we as your church would be mobilized to be your witnesses. We, we pray that we would be that in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our complexes, in our suburb. We pray that we would be that as the church in our city of Johannesburg. But we pray, Lord, also that as our devotions and our services uh, are broadcast uh, via the various online channels, that, that you would be pleased to use our witness even to the ends of the earth at this time. Won't you be pleased to draw men and women and boys and girls to yourself, uh, that they too would become followers of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So we thank you that uh, we can, in a sense, look up today and, and acknowledge you as our risen and ascended Savior. Uh, and then very quickly uh, look horizontally to the work that you've given us to do. Won't you help us to do it, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.